welcome everybody to this session. Um, we're expecting quite a few more people, so no doubt people will arrive during the course of the, of the 90 minutes. And um, I, as you probably know, I'm a director in Conflict Dynamics, so it's really my pleasure to welcome you from Conflict Dynamics to this session and to welcome our speakers, who I'll introduce in due course, who have very generously given time to prepare and time to be with us here this morning. In addition to being a director of Conflict Dynamics, um, as uh, uh, like my colleagues, I've been involved in RBOs since the 80s and have always felt they are a wonderful mechanism for resolving and preventing conflict um, on the shop floor in organizations. And so uh, I'm going to be really uh, keen to share with you thoughts and to hear from colleagues um, on, this, on this webinar. Zoom functionality, all very straightforward, um, as I think we all know by now. Uh, we, we've got a Q&A function um, on the bottom bar, the bottom of the screen. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we go along. And what we've agreed between the three of us, the, the, sorry, the four of us, my three speakers and myself, is to, we will try to answer those questions as we go along. Uh, and anything that remains unanswered, we'll deal with at the end. Um, although the chat is a, lo a lovely option too, it's easier to answer your questions more specifically in the Q&A. So feel free to raise your questions there. The format of the session is that we're going to have uh, the three presentations and I will introduce each speaker as we go along. That's Mark Anstey first, Ace Mokokodi second, and Misha Kravuku third. I'll then turn to them and give them each an opportunity to add to what they've said, having now heard each other. And then we'll uh, open it for discussion and questions. So that's our format. Let's uh, get a sense of who is with us today before we dive into the content. And we have a poll to do that. And so Robin, if you could launch the poll, um, just for us to have a sense of who we're speaking to and what's important to you. You can answer more than one, you might be here in multiple roles. And no doubt as people arrive, the demographics on this question will shift. But at the moment, it's looking like most people are quite new to the idea of RBOs. Just a couple more to answer. Okay, Robin, I think let's stop there. We've uh, got a large percentage of people have responded. And yes, the majority of people are completely new to the idea of RBOs. And so that's very useful to know because we, we have got, Mark is going to start off with some of the nuts and bolts, what is an RBO, and some thoughts on uh, 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 the, 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 the key elements of an RBO, rationale for the RBO, and then uh, Ace and Meshach are going to be looking at what it's like to participate in an RBO or facilitate an RBO and how effective it can be uh, in the moment in the facilitation, but also in the organization. So I think we're going to be able to address uh, those needs very well. Thank you. So uh, a bit about the background to RBOs, which you might have seen in some of the advertising and in uh, the blog that Mark wrote for us. But um, let me uh, give that to you. RBOs were developed uh, quite a while ago by the FMCS in, a, in, a, in the US, the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, uh, specifically for interventions as interventions in deeply conflicted organizations. Uh, and, and, and we're talking here of deeply conflicted labor management um, relationships as a starting point. The first RBO was conducted 
in South Africa at Johnson Tiles in 1986, so that's a good few years ago, with local mediators, including Mark, under the mentorship of two very experienced FMCS mediators. So we learned from the Americans, but very, very quickly, more RBOs have been in, conducted in South Africa than had ever been conducted in America. And I think that that's probably still the case and to a huge extent. There have been some very notable RBOs in South Africa. The one that people often talk about is the Mercedes-Benz RBO that took place in 1989. Mark and I were part of that team. There were five facilitators, as was Charles Newpin, who's uh, due to join us today as well, um, Paul Pretorius and um, Indran Moodley. There have been RBOs in many organizations, to name a few, uh, VW, Ford, General Motors, Teneco, Coca-Cola, SA Breweries, Portnet, um, <clears throat> many universities, parastatals, and many of those were done through IMSA. And then post IMSA, I think facilitable, well, the CCMA has certainly encouraged RBOs, uh, but a lot of the uh, facilitators who learned in those early days about how to conduct an RBO then started uh, promoting RBOs more directly. Conflict Dynamics, which was established in 1996, has been conducting RBOs um, over all these uh, tw past 25 years or so. And the most recent RBO conducted through Conflict D Dynamics was conducted just this week by William Thompson, who's on our call, who facilitated an RBO between Sanral and the Union Limusa. So it, uh, it, it's really alive. And William sent through a fantastic report, Vanessa, and he worked on this report um, to the company and the union. And it contained wonderful pictures of the dynamics, what was going on in the RBO, which William, I've uh, lifted one or two to put in the presentation to, to bring it to life. Um, but it was a really heartwarming report to read. And it took me straight back to the basic tenets of an RBO. I know William would um, kick me if I didn't tell the, one of the stories from the Mercedes RBO. I'm not gonna do that now, I'll come to that later. Um, but uh, some of those stories are quite amazing uh, from, from back then. And I'm sure we all have incredible stories of transformation in relationships to tell about uh, how the RBO um, has an impact. So we wanted to reignite the interest in RBOs and and also because we found it very interesting that we get requests in conflict dynamics for an RBO. People, organizations come to us and say, we want you to run an RBO. And then when we scratch a little below the surface, we realize that don't really know what it's all about. They've heard of it. They've perhaps heard it's been very successful. And um, so then we have to have the, the conversations about what's involved. And it's a big resource commitment. And so our speakers will, will talk about that and, and how to deal with those challenges around um, conducting an RBO that is worthwhile. It's not something, it's not like a mediation. It's not a, a, a sort of um, one day wonder. It's a, a careful process which starts with pre-planning and follow, continues through to follow up. So we'll hear from our speakers on, on that. So I'm going to leave it at that and turn now to Mark. And let me introduce Mark, although he hardly needs any introduction. We were talking earlier about how he's been involved in all of our working lives in one way or the other over many, many years. And, um, but let me give you a bit of a background for those people who don't know Mark. Mark um, is a labor and community mediator and was one in South Africa for 35 years with a particular interest in relationship building initiatives or interventions. He was part of that team that uh, facilitated the first RBO at Johnson Tiles in 1986. And um, his most recent RBO intervention was in 2019. He's an emeritus professor with Nelson Mandela University, a senior um, academy associate with the Klingendal Institute in, Mark, is it Holland or Belgium? Uh, the Hague. In the uh, Netherlands, yeah. In the Netherlands, right. And has a number of publications in the field of conflict management, including negotiating uh, reconciliation in peacemaking with Valerie Rousseau, 
the book that I always go to is simply Negotiating Conflict, Mark's, I think, very first book, uh, although he uh, wrote um, quite prolifically at the Institute for Industrial Relations as well, where we worked together in the 80s. So Mark, welcome and over to you. We're looking forward to hearing about um, RBO's nuts and bolts, really. Thank you, Felicity, and hello to everyone. Um, and especially some of my old mentors and people I've had the privilege of working with over the years. Good to hear Charles will be joining us and uh, Clive Thompson. Um, Felicity, you, of course, I think Phil Cohen's out there. Um, and uh, I know I'm surrounded by people who have probably more experience than me in conducting these processes at this point in time, not least uh, William Thompson, who's um, shared information and ideas over the years, uh, although I haven't seen him recently. Um, great to hear that you're still involved and doing such uh, great work in this field. The... Um, I've been asked to sort of lay out some nuts and bolts of the process and the rationale. And I, I often think that um, South Africa is a, is a wonderful example of a fractured society in which people have divided by ideology and um, all the other traditional class and clan and tribe and race. And I find these now everywhere where I go, we were not unique in, in those dimensions, but I think we were unique in the manner in which we approached them from various points. And one of the key interventions, uh, I think was the RBO. Um, so I'm gonna make a few points about, about that. Um, and I'll, I'll come to the points on the slides shortly, um, but just, a little bit of background that organizations, successful organizations are key to uh, economic growth and economic growth is critical for stability and issues of wealth creation and, and distribution. There's no single point of arrival in political change processes, which means that workplaces continually bring together people from a diversity of backgrounds and experiences, both before, during, and after South Africa's political transition. People were coming together every day in workplaces with divergent perceptions of justice, um, defined by their backgrounds and group narratives, their membership of identity groups, and their past and current modes of interaction. So a political transition it somehow never ends. Um, and we never escape our past, but we're always trying to create a future for ourselves. And workplaces, I think, are the only places where people across social divides and belief systems come together on a daily basis with a common purpose. And they may disagree about uh, the shape of the justice of a larger economic and political system. But I think everyone realizes at some point that the success of the organization has meaning for them, that they, their own welfare is dependent on the welfare and success of the organization which employs them or which provides returns on their investment and so on. We made a lot of progress, I think, on in terms of legal systems, political participation, systems of procedural justice. Uh, but these do not deal effectively always with the long-term residual resentments, perceptions of discrimination, sensitivity to signs of disrespect, aspirations for greater change that people people across these divides bring with them into workplaces. And they cannot be effectively dealt with unless they are raised and responded to. So um, the question becomes, 
if you've done all the right things in terms of a, an effective LR system, what else? And what do you do about relationships that continue to flounder? And I'm going to race through a couple of points and it will be a race, but I know you're going to all get the slides. And the first thing is that RBO interventions have been used to repair, and this is where we started, seriously antagonistic relationships within organizations. But they're also a vehicle to build common vision and to review progress, uh, redesign systems, and I'll do a very hurried example at the end, but to lay a platform for organizational transformation. There's recognition that conflict is inescapable in, in relationships, um, but also interdependence and, and the need for cooperative endeavor, um, despite the, the different frames of reference and experience that people come from. The very important point for me, and I know that people structure this differently, but I'm fairly fixed on the process of proposal development rather than being grievance driven. It's quite easy to raise grievances and to become possessed by the past and, and reiterate and uh, deepen one's grievances through catharsis. Proposals is hard work. We know what we don't want, but knowing what we want is much harder work. And the first section of a process is driving people to develop proposals to put to one another rather than repeating grievances. Um, there's quite a lot of work in psychology now about rebutting the myths of catharsis. Um, and I'll just make one reference to a case here where I had within the structure sort of driven the everyone to proposal formation uh, on day one. They pinned up their proposals before they left and spoke to them. When they came back on day two, the union said, we don't like your, your process. Um, and in brackets, we don't like you much. Um, we came here to vomit on the managers. This was spoken by a union official who shortly afterwards became the HR manager for this company. Um, and um, I said to him, you know, if you'd come here and just spilled your guts on um, grievances, those managers wouldn't be sitting here today. The fact that you left proposals up on the wall, they sat and looked at them for a long time and said, wow, there's a lot more in common and things we can deal with than we ever expected while they were busy throwing stones at us and accusing us of things. And we can do stuff with this. Um, and the catharsis happens behind the proposals the anger, the frustrations, the resentment of, of the years, um, because it can be used then to illustrate why those proposals are up on the wall in the first place. It's future oriented, uh, therefore. So it's pulled by the proposals and in developing proposals, the parties develop an agenda for themselves. Um, it's not an alternative process for disciplinary action or collective bargaining. There was a period in the area where I worked where pretty much the standard approach was in order to build constructive relationships, dismiss the human resource manager. Um, and we had to take a fairly robust approach to that. Um, there are procedures to deal with disciplinary action. Um, if you allow that to continue, what follows is well, in order to have a constructive working relationship, get rid of all the shop stewards. So keeping the process sober and keeping it focused on relationship building rather than elimination, mutual elimination, I think is quite important. An idea of material from many disciplines um, is useful. It's not simply a facilitation, an idea of process of organization development, world-class manufacturing systems, 
it's premised in the logic of management by objectives. Um, and uh, the, the, the uh, reality that employee participation is a critical but ignored uh, usefulness um, for organizations' performance. And critically, it needs leadership. And um, in, in other forums, I, I use a little maxim that agreements occur between adversaries when, when leaders begin to trust one another more than their own extreme elements. Um, and it, it's perhaps important to note that not everyone survives a relationship building process. It's not all holding hands into the sunset. Some managers find they can't live with a, a new regime, behavioral regime. Uh, some unionists can't let go of uh, hard adversarialism in terms of a sense of uh, loss of identity in, in the process. Um, and it does, in each instance, I've been struck by the, by the necessity and usefulness of having strong leaders um, involved in the process. Could we have the next slide? Uh, the process is structured um, traditionally along a pre-RBO engagement. Briefings, visits with the parties are usually run mind through a joint meeting and then am open to private caucuses to discuss matters of concern with the parties. Um, but the pre-briefing is, is, is joint. Um, the opening process uh, is usually where well, we'll we'll come to some of the detail of it, but expectations and basically a contract on uh, a the question that's going to drive the process and around which agenda is created, and then proposal development, which stretches people beyond simply identifying problems, um, and they're required basically to turn grievances into proposals. Uh, then action planning and an, an implementation and follow-up process. And action planning largely is about who must do what differently into the future, what systems have to be redesigned and so on. Um, and then very importantly, and is the implementation and follow-up process. Um, so who's responsible to do what, with who and by what times, and how will the process be monitored by the parties themselves and if necessary, through follow-up RBOs? Um, so what you're doing is creating a platform or a framework for future relations. It's not like a wage dispute settled in a single or you know, a single set of sessions um, where finite matter is dealt with, closed contracted and you're into the next round of something else. This is meant to be creating a framework to carry a larger relationship forward. Could we have the next slide? Some key points, realism. Uh, you're operating in an organization. Um, you, the parties are there with a larger sense of shared purpose in terms of the organization, whatever their interpersonal or ideological differences. The mindset matters. You're in a healing rather than hunting process. Um, sometimes I've been involved in processes where somebody concurrently run, wants to run an in-depth um, inquisitorial process as to who's had their fingers in the till. Um, and as they, as we both brief the parties, I've sort of had to say, actually, either do your disciplinary processes before or after the uh, RBO, because you are going to be collecting evidence on people, whereas I try to help people not to collect evidence, to move past the evidence, past the culpability um, uh, process into building new relationships. And if people approach the workplace every day in attack mode and collecting evidence and building a box file of who said what to who in the corridor three years ago, it's very hard to build out of that unless you help people in a letting go process. 
Um, listening differently. No out, outright uh, rejections of proposals. Exploration is the key word. And then the skill of turning grievances into proposals and shifting from an adversarial to a problem solving approach uh, with this proposals before venting logic. Um, and a logic that says, well, if we, who has to do what differently? It's a behaviorally based process. Um, that's how we understand each other's attitudes is the way they behave towards one and each other. And sometimes we misinterpret what those attitudes are and surfacing those issues becomes important. Be honest with sensitivity. Uh, fragile relationships require sensitivity about how you raise issues between one, one another. And uh, quite often, largely management, be these battles of principle. You know, it's just the principle of the thing. Um, well, what is the principle? And what, what are you trying to get at? What's the point of the principle can become quite a difficult uh, issue. And one of the areas to be dealt with uh, with sensitivity. Often those uh, are about authority in relationships and use of uh, authority. Can we have the next slide? Woo. Running, running late already. Um, I, when we started, uh, certainly in my experience, we were doing three to four days um, processes. Uh, as time went on uh, and pressure from the parties, largely I came have or came down to a two day process uh, myself, um, and um, with follow ups, and um, they're structured so that there is very briefly a joint session of defining what the guiding question should be. Largely, parties, in my experience, come back to in order to build a co constructive working relationship, labor should, management should, um, and that parties develop proposals around those. Um, I've been in a lot of processes where we run joint sessions, but in more recent times, because of the pressure of time and what people are comfortable with, that labor and management develop proposals separately for one another and put them up and present them. And then we deal with them in a common caucus overnight. Um, uh, sorry. And then there's a presentation each party uh, to the other of their proposals. And um, overnight, the facilitator of the RBO sits up categorizes, collates, and uh, builds up a record of the day to put before the parties for the next day. Next slide. Um, each delegate then gets a copy of the proposals, and each proposal is cross-referenced. So every proposal um, is referenced either management to labor or management to management and so on. Um, so that uh, parties can get to grips with those. Um, and then separate or mixed groups to work out action steps. And there may be a wide variety of, of issues emerges. Uh, often communications, procedures, training and empowerment, issues of discrimination, mutual respect, the use of authority and supervision. Uh, and quite startling over time, I found that people did not want no management. What they wanted was sound management, fair management, informed management. And quite a lot of the union proposals were about being more effectively managed in workplaces rather than simply resistance to, to management. And then overnight, um, and this day two tends to be a long one. Um, and I've usually undertaken the job of projecting the agreement onto the screen and allowing the parties to correct the language as it appears, which helps them sharpen their thinking about what they're getting into in the next phase. Um, and then uh, 
the facilitator again collects all that, types it up, agreed action steps, deadlines, responsibilities, and shares the documentation back to the parties. And um, that's the shape of the, the document that eventually emerges over the two or three day uh, process, depending how you manage these things these days. There is a case, but I'm, I'm, uh, and I wanted to take us into that, but perhaps I should let others speak first now that the um, platform's been laid. Felicity, I'm not sure what you want to do. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, and Mark, those uh, next two slides, uh, let's come back to that a little later. Okay. So, um, Robin, if you could turn us, um, let's just have, oh yeah, there we are. So we've got um, Ace or Atwell Mokhodi. And um, Ace uh, is a seasoned ER and HR practitioner. Um, we've worked together since the early 90s through IMSA and in many other situations. He's a very experienced HR person, but also a very experienced facilitator and trainer with experience in a, a number of industries. He's worked in the Chamber of Mines. He's also been a, a commissioner at the CCMA. He has worked with Kelly and P PNG uh, in, as a director in IR. Tiger Brands, um, where he was senior HR manager, Sassel, uh, Gibella, head of HR, and is currently working with Bushveld Minerals. So a wide range of industries and a lot of experience. Um, he's a Chiquiso panelist, works closely with Conflict Dynamics as well, IMI qualified and CEDA accredited media mediator. And um, in his capacity at IMSA was uh, instrumental in undertaking research into RBOs. Um, and has a, a deep insight uh, into RBOs. I've asked him to speak particularly from the point of view of a user of RBOs. So in his capacity as an, an HR person, um, although he does also facilitate RBOs uh, as, a, as a consultant. So over to you, Ace. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Felicity. Uh, thank you so very much for the uh, introduction. And let me also thank the Prof. Uh, Mark uh, for a very comprehensive uh, foundation. I'm also mindful uh, that uh, we are surrounded on this call by what I refer to as the doyens of conflict resolution. Some of whom have been uh, very instrumental in my, my career. I'm very much uh, very much uh, uh, acknowledging the, the role that they've played in, in my development uh, as, a, as a facilitator and as a conflict resolution practitioner. So thank you very much and then welcome. Thanks for joining us. What I wanted to do is just simplify this now that the prof has laid a good foundation. Let me just in one sentence acknowledge that uh, indeed uh, we, are still riddled with the, our history. There's still pre-1994 patterns in terms of leadership styles and adversarial relationships that I think uh, the prof has outlined very, very well. So we still have the personal, interpersonal and structural barriers which prevent uh, proper dialogue. So those are the realities that we face even in this period where we have the new Labor Relations Act. We're struggling to put in place the workplace forum. All those are indications of a society that is still in mistrust. We still see patterns of coercion and co-option, less collaboration and less co-creation. And that is our landscape. And the RBO then uh, fulfills an important role as a transformative transformational and catalytic. So I need to also maybe start with the, the words of Professor Christo Nell, which, who is a thought leader that I follow very well. He makes a very simple and profound statement uh, just to give context to my presentation. And I think this will be the thread of my presentation. 
where in his book, Transformation Without Sacrifice, makes a, a very profound statement by saying that you cannot have a, a functional society without a functional economy. In the same breath, you cannot have a functional economy without functional uh, relationships. And I've added my spin to it, say, to say that uh, there's no functional business without a functional relationship. And this is where really the philosophy around the RBO comes in. So I'll go to my first slide. So speaking as a, as a user of the RBO, I need to make the point that uh, Context is very important. So let me give you a brief description of what obtained in my circumstances and why I had to choose the RBO. So we found autocratic styles of leadership. There was transition from one union to the other. Unions were fired at slight irritation. There were agreements which were implemented but unsigned, the broader people were not socialized on, on the agreements. We had unprotected strikes. And we had what I call uh, uh, hygiene issues. Hygiene issues in my ER lingo is uh, things like simply getting those meetings going, structuring yourself, fixing the statutory issues, and also managing the escalation of really uh, small issues or small problems. So this was a scene uh, in this business that uh, I joined. And for me, if I were to sum up what I think I saw was really people being consumed by their narrow space and their narrow prisms and what I would call, uh, they were involved in what I call village fights. And they scored village victories through strikes and showing power, people being fired. One example is the union leaders were suspended and then they were brought back because there was no evidence. This for me was very, very toxic. And I then had to look at the relationship costs the cycle of time it took for us to resolve issues. It was just a culture of negative uh, engagement. I then thought that the, the RBO was the perfect, perfect process. Because for me, the RBO is very transformational. I chose it because I realized that there was diminishing trust. And I believe that the, the RBO is a tried and tested process. As Felicity has explained, I've had the pleasure of observing RBOs. I've had the pleasure of facilitating, but I have had the pleasure of being part of the process as a user. And it's a flexible methodology. In my view, when I say flexible methodology, it's flexible in that uh, you could customize your own needs depending on what you see. In our case, there were clear uh, examples of lack of emotional intelligence. There were also clear examples of uh, the lack of uh, engagement platforms. And thirdly, there was also a need for us to use the RBO as a learning platform. So it can be used in, in various ways. So what was important also was to try and deal with the issue of conflict wisdom, which was lacking on both sides. And that's the reason why we chose the RBO. We can move to the next slide. So what were the challenges in rolling it out? So obviously for, for the reasons that Prof has explained and what I said earlier on, uh, it requires a lot of persuasion because you find that Sometimes the leadership don't understand the concepts, have no idea of proper people management skills. So it was a selling process. I had to go to the EXCO, to the operational team, 
and to the management teams and try to sell the concept of uh, the RBO. So it involves a lot of uh, connecting to the business rationale and the return on investment, crafting business case for all internal stakeholders. Most importantly, I had to go through convincing everyone that you have to budget for the RBO. Now, this is my personal view. Um, I think I've been successful, successful wherever I've worked to persuade businesses to budget for the RPU. And I'm saying this because if you listen carefully to the prof, RBO actually applies various disciplines. For me, it's part of change leadership. It's part of the ethics and values conversation. It should form and be an integral part of the people's strategy. It relates to company risk and governance. All Gallup studies have shown that if you have an engaged force, you stand a chance to be successful as a business. So that, I think, is one key thing that we should put across to all people who use the RPO or even practitioners of RPO to say this should be seen as a proactive uh, process rather than a reactive uh, uh, process. We can go to the next slide. It also fulfills the role of refining and defining goals. Very important for climate creation. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you have mission and vision that is not cascading down to the workforce, and particularly your stakeholders, it's important that uh, it may be important to invoke the RBO. It's also important for the culture conversation, for all definitions. It's an empowering process. I think it also helps to lift people from their village and, and take them to a point where they have an understanding of the product processes that are available. Next slide. So I've, I've really wrestled uh, with the, the concept of benefits. Uh, what benefits does the RPO uh, 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 do for, for companies or for businesses? I've come to this few points to say, in my view, it does assist in goal alignment. You know, Professor Kobayashi, one of the gurus in manufacturing excellence, uh, crafted the uh, the 20 keys of manufacturing excellence. And key two of these 20 keys talks to goal alignment. And it's really about aligning on the mission and goals. And I think the RBO does that uh, quite well uh, because it's difficult to talk or facilitate an RBO without uh, visiting the values of the company and the goals of the company. I've mentioned climate creation. The number one benefit for me, and I think this is the most understated benefit, is that the RBO actually, if you invoke the process, you will leverage from the experience of the facilitators who have been exposed to various industries. That for me is my number one takeaway on the benefits of, a, of an RBO. Because the facilitator is there to guide, there to educate, but he's also there to share best practices. And he leaves you away from your own village and your narrow prisons so that you don't get consumed by your village fights and the village victims. I've already said it's a learning platform. Let me give you an example. Um, in one facil facilitation that um, I, I invited the facilitator and we agreed that this one was going to be a learning platform. And what we focused on was emotional intelligence and conflict wisdom. So it was very important that we do that because there was an obvious lack of skill around how to handle conflict. People were consumed by dysfunctional conflict. I will not speak to the rest, if we can go to the next slide. In the final analysis, uh, in my view, uh, in my lived experience, I've already mentioned goal alignment, 
for me, it's a big return on investment. I've already said that there's no functional business without a functional relationship. You spend less time on disputes and meetings that are necessary. You have better processes, better consultation. In this instance, we realize that uh, in the past years, there's been many strikes, but once we went through the process of the RBO, there was less disruption. I've already said that uh, it is important that we budget for RBO as a proactive process rather than a reactive process. And it also helps with John problem solving culture. For me, it supports the business strategy and it will encourage a virtuous rather than a vicious cycle. I want to pause there um, and perhaps give the other suggestions. Thank you very much, Ace. And something that strikes struck me as you were speaking was how what you're saying and what we're all saying about RBOs resonates so well with the theme we've been trying to build up in conflict dynamics over the last couple of webinars, uh, two of which Vanessa held recently with, um, uh, with colleagues, William um, Thompson and Ntukulu uh, Maisha as well, who are on the call. And that is the theme of uh, collaboration and cooperation in the workplace. And your idea of an annual RBO um, just makes me think, you know, that wouldn't that be a fantastic basis for a workplace forum. So in fact, you're, you're not funding uh, an RBO per se, but you've, you've, that's where you start, but you then start funding a, a workplace forum, which is like an ongoing RBO. Um, so that, that, that sits very well with our theme. So let's go, thank you very much. Let's go to Meshak, who is a former union official, um, and, uh, and, and actually I remember and worked with Meshak uh, a lot during the 80s as a mediator. And um, he was a senior CCMA commissioner for 20 years, uh, former director of Tukiso Dispute Settlement and remains on their panel. Um, also a member of the panel of Mediate Works and of Conflict Dynamics. He's the chairperson of the Road Accident Fund and IEC Bargaining Forums and previously also chaired many other bargaining forums, the HPCSA, PCSCB, uh, uh, NHBRC, and NHLS. Um, so I'm sure that you are more familiar with those acronyms than, than I am. He is also a, a conflict dynamics accredited mediator with IMI qualification and CEDA qualification. And he specializes in RBOs and has conducted these um, over, over many years in many countries, not just South Africa, but Lesotho, Swaziland, Zambia, Mozambique, Kenya. And he also uh, specializes in facilitating complex wage negotiation processes um, and has worked very closely with conflict dynamics in those processes. So welcome, uh, Meshak. Meshak's going to focus on the facilitator um, experience of um, RBOs. And um, so Meshak, if you could just uh, put your camera on. Uh, it says the host has stopped it. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's, that's the vicious me. Sorry, hang on a sec. Um, let me just undo that. Right. Okay, so you can you can put your camera on and I'll just, once you're on, I'll hide everyone else. Uh, still saying the same thing. Uh, Robin, can you help us with that? Here we are, I've sent you a message to start you. There we are, okay, good. Okay, um, good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks, uh, Felicity, and thanks to my co-presenters. Uh, um, when I saw that I was going to be the third one, I so wish that I would have been the first one, 
because you've put two very great people before me, but, but that is okay. And is that uh, point you raised about the annual RBO, <clears throat> just uh, in this week, uh, I was called to Le Palale, which is a good four hours drive from where I am. And um, they wanted an RBO, that's what they referred to it. But I said, we can't have it in one day, the two to three days and so on. But um, they persuaded me, I said, fine, I'll come. I drove, when I got there, indeed it was a review process. They had their RBO the previous year and uh, it was a review process, uh, but basically, at the end of the RBO, there is an implementation plan, implementation process, which they did exceptionally well. And the purpose of that meeting that they called me, which they referred to, to be the RBO, was really to sit and say, what have we done right? What have we done wrong? And uh, from there, let's have our bride, let's have our meat, let's have our beers and uh, just to consolidate that relationship. So I do confirm that it is important to time and again um, visit the relationship of the parties and the idea of an annual RPO uh, after the process that I had in the Palale resonates uh, with me. I have seen some of the people that are attending today some I've seen many, many years back, like Phil Cohen, I think it was when I was still in the trade union. Uh, people like Absol Subedar, who I worked with, Bill I've worked with, and there's a host of uh, other people I can't name everyone. Um, I will concentrate uh, on what I saw in and experience insofar as this process is concerned. When I was still in the trade union, and after what I see now. And Robin, if you can put up the first slide. What would normally happen sometimes is that um, um, the process would be used to resolve current disputes, whether it's a dispute of rights or a dispute of mutual interest. So, the parties go into this process to actually, with the hope that uh, they are going to be able to resolve a particular issue. Um, I, I went a solid three days on one occasion with one company in aviation. And when we were on the third day, putting our action plan together, then <laughs> the union official said, hold on. What about the three dismissals that we have? We can't enter into this relationship without those three. And um, that debate went on and on and that process, process collapsed because of that. And uh, for me, it then uh, taught me a whole lot of things that I will talk to as we proceed. On other occasion, uh, the parties would look at this as an opportunity to improve um, the wages and conditions of employment. So you can, during process, um, talk about an undesirable shift um, uh, process or shift align, um, allowance and want to improve that. So it's always important to talk to parties about this. Uh, like I said, I will revisit this. And sometimes there is a, demand for a dismissal of a manager or managers or dismissals of shop stewards. And the, these are things that will pop up. And, and there's good reason why these things do come up. Um, there's also an issue of uh, uh, wounds that do not want to heal. Parties want to settle all scores and they will use this process for that. Um, the process can also be used as a strategy to increase productivity or as a strategy to um, ensure that the union uh, cooperates when the issue of retrenchments are discussed 
or for the union to avoid, to, to force the company to avoid uh, embarking on a process of uh, retrenchment. So those are the negative and excuses that will from time to time come up that as a facilitator one would have to deal with. Like I said, I will deal with this um, more as we proceed. Robin, shall we? Thank you. Um, for me, it's always important to have a pre-RBO session with both parties uh, where you can establish the purpose for the process. You get an opportunity to manage unrealistic expectations. Those are the ones that are also referred to. And you do this on both sides and you establish a good report and you outline the process and methodology. It's important to do that because once the parties get into the process, they are aware of what they're going to do. Um, they're already uh, aware of possible outcomes and how the process is going to be carried out. Because uh, once you start separating the parties, um, I've heard um, in Cape Town some time back, um, Shops was, was asking, why must management go away on soup demands? Let them sit here so that we face each other. And um, I had to explain that we cannot do that. So it's important to deal with those things, manage those uh, expectations from the answer. There are instances where in an establishment you have uh, um, more than one trade union. Um, you can work with them coming in as representing themselves separately, but it always helps to encourage them to work together and they usually agree to work together and they can all come up with their issues. It uh, manages time. It also helps with the process, but importantly, it also helps the unions to also acknowledge that uh, in that establishment they coexist, um, though they are different unions, to begin to accept that we belong, we do not belong to the same unions, but we are a union. So we all have to occupy this space in a harmonious way. And to establish if there is a need to include non-unionized employees. Um, there are instances where you find that uh, the union only has about 50% of 51% of employees. The rest are not unionized. And you can see that you're talking 49% is a huge number. And these are people that uh, do have an influence on the running of the company. I have received the request from employers to say, can we get representatives to represent those people and so on? But it helps to talk to the unions to explain to them that um, you are not being undermined, your role is not being undermined, but we're just trying to cover the 49% so that their voice can also be heard. And I've never had a situation where the unions said no. Of course, they will say that as long as we're acknowledged as the trade unions, that's fine. Um, you also use that. Uh, occasion to establish if there is a need to include non-unionist employees. I've dealt with that. Um, importantly, and I, I learned this from a very good uh, colleague of mine, um, John Brandt, that um, right from the onset, you develop ground rules for, for the process. Um, I have lots of them, about just over 20 that uh, I would let the parties develop their own. And then uh, if we have time, I'll come up with mine to say, what about this? The ground rules will deal with, with such things like you do not interrupt. Um, you arrive on time for the meeting, the management of laptops and cell phones, the shouting, um, all those things that are, are common, um, mutual respect and all that so that 
the process unfolds in a very harmonious way, but also importantly, once you have the ground rules, it helps you as a facilitator to take charge. For instance, what I do is that if a person is speaking, someone else is in disagreement and uh, wants to shout, I will say, hold on, please check your ground rules, look at number one. Um, it talks about not being unduly defensive. Um, importantly, those amongst those ground rules, there'll be one that tells the parties that from what we're going to be discussing, there will be facts and there will be perceptions. Now it's for you as the facilitator to highlight to the parties that please let's not sit too much on this. Let us proceed. Remember, we did acknowledge through the ground rules that there will be facts and perceptions, but also to remind the parties that I'm not arbitrating. So I'm not going to say there's a winner or a loser or who is, has won or not. And that ensures that uh, we're on track, uh, we're running the same race at the same pace. Uh, Robin? There, 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 there is a whole lot of people who want to be um, RBO facilitators. And then there's a whole lot of uh, simple things that need to be done. Uh, first, you have to be well equipped if you want to be an RBO facilitator. Uh, the first bullet is that you must have a passion. Uh, I did not see a whole lot of people in the attendance register, but um, the, 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 there is a person who I was going to do an RBO, conduct an RBO in Mozambique. And then he wanted to come and be the scribe. And then uh, I asked him, why do you want to be a scribe? He said, no, I haven't done RBOs and I want to see how you do it. And I'm willing to just come and be your scribe. So we, we went to Mozambique and they sat through the two, three days, uh, came up with a very good report. And today he's one of the top um, RBO uh, facilitators and uh, he today owns his own uh, dispute resolution company. But for me, what I got there was actually the passion. You know, you've got to love what you do. Uh, can I just say was I'm on passion? You know, it translates to other processes whether you're doing wage negotiations or any other process, you've got this relationship building thing within you that you always carry. And the manner in, in, in which you conduct even those uh, um, wage negotiations, facilitations, everyone can see that you are relationship focused. It's also important to understand the process and by process, I want to go back to Mark's presentation that outlined the respective steps that you have to take. Um, so you have to follow that process very well. Um, you've got to understand labor relations. There are issues that will come up where you have to assist the parties and clarify certain things without dictating to them. You have to develop the necessary skills. You know, when you um, thematize and when you put uh, issues uh, in Mark's presentation, he spoke about collating after the process so where the parties will sit and in the evening, you then have to sit down and do that collation and so on. Um, you have to do it very carefully and to ensure that you've put uh, all the issues in the appropriate theme. So it takes a little bit of skill to do that. I've spoken about uh, observing on similar, similar processes. You can do that by co-facilitating uh, or being a scribe. I, myself, um, how I learned about the RBO, uh, I was called by a very good uh, colleague to come and co-facilitate with him. But whilst uh, the facilitation 
was in process, I had my little book where I was taking notes, where I was following the steps and all that. And after that, once the report was out, I made a comparison on the report and on the notes that I was taking. From there, I was on my own until today. So to observe uh, helps a lot. I know we do like to make a little bit of money here and there, but if you just go and say, look, let me just observe and so on. For that day, I don't think it will do you harm because there will be very good return. What I've also observed is that uh, in the RBO process, you need uh, a whole lot of patience. Um, you also need tolerance because uh, you, you've got people who are not happy initially. You've got people who do not share the same interest, people who come with conflicting mandates, uh, people who are wounded. There are things that may have happened um, in the past during their relationship. So you need to be alive to that and you need to be patient with them, have a little bit of tolerance, of course, without, not, not, without compromising the process itself. And um, lastly, you've got to have effective negotiating skills because in an RBO, particularly when you come to solutions, uh, you do need um, some level of uh, effective negotiating skills um, that will help uh, unlock um, difficult differences that would arise from time to time. Was that the last one, Robin? That Thank is you. the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Meshek. Uh, and you know, I, I, listening to each of our speakers, I I'm so struck by the understated um, tone of the of, of of their presentations, and um, and sort of self-deprecating, humble approach. Uh, and I think that um, I, I just really want to recognize their enormous experience over very many years. And uh, as, as Meshach has said, really making the investment, if you want to be a facilitator and also as a company or a union, if you want to uh, have an RBO work, it takes an investment of time and resources and it pays back uh, many fold over the years. I think let's now um, uh, invite everybody to uh, Mark and uh, Ace and Mishak to add uh, any further points. So Mark, I'm just turning, well, I'm going to turn each person's video on. And Mark, I know there were two further slides that you had that you might want to now um, talk through. And then we'll turn to Ace and to Mishak. Robin, could you maybe bring those slides up? Yeah. Sorry, I was halfway through typing a response to a, to a question from Clive Thompson. So I'll come back to that question on the um, on the system. Um, the case I, I wanted to just briefly talk about. And I often uh, think about this. This is, in fact, reported and written up in RBO terms in, in my book, which has just gone out of print, I might tell you. Um, <laughs> not sure how to advise you to get it if you're interested. Um, but this particular process was one built on the back of urgency. Um, <clears throat> basically, and I'm not shy to use the names of the companies involved. This was a supplier uh, to Volkswagen. And um, <clears throat> Volkswagen, uh, if you've been in an auto plant, it is a highly tuned by the second uh, manufacturing process. And um, this supplier, which was a company called Tenneco, um, was in all kinds of trouble. So they had a sort of war on with uh, the managers and the trade union officials and shop stewards and the workforce were at constant loggerheads. There was uh, ongoing 
strike action, um, some bullying, constant uh, testing of power, largely through um, wildcat action or, th or through extended um, challenges through, through the labor relations system. And they were delivering poorly to, to the uh, customer. Uh, eventually, the um, company fired the CEO who was in place and imported uh, a new CEO with international experience, a South African, but who had worked internationally on in troubled companies and largely uh, in Eastern Europe um, just after their transitions. Um, and within a few days, he was called to the um, to the to the um, customer and basically given a an ultimatum um, that if he didn't step up in a very short space of time, they would have no further business. And as this was their sole local customer, this would of course been devastating. And of course, under those conditions. Um, and I've, I've written this up a second time in terms of leadership styles, and I've sent that to Felicity. I'm happy that it's shared. But um, how to negotiate that? Well, of course, he had to take on an accommodative style and promise to fix things if the if the company was to be presented or saved. Um, so he comes back to a workforce now that's all over the place, hostile to itself and um, sets calls for an RBO, the union official agreed. Um, and within a very short space of time, we were doing an RBO. But it, it took a particular shape. And um, his, he approached with a very simple picture, that middle um, section on the um, on the uh, production process from suppliers through incoming logistics, manufacturing, outgoing logistics. And he put before the, the meeting, he said, basically, we're in trouble. I am an expert in this area. I know what has to be fixed. So you can trust me that if we fix this, we will be able to deliver to the customer. We all have an interest in this. Um, now, how we fix it is really what matters. So how are we going to work together to fix the problem? So he did not arrive with a, a sack full of answers, which he might well have done. Um, it, but a sack full of joint problems to be solved up and down the uh, production process. Um, his suppliers were all over the place, which was part of the problem. He could have done what uh, Volkswagen did to him in terms of saying, if you don't get your act together, um, but instead took a helpful approach. We can help you fix yourselves because we need you to fix yourselves to help us fix ourselves in, uh, uh, along a supply chain. Um, and um, he, we then evolved the um, sort of, well, what have we got to do to address this problem? Um, and it took on the form of uh, a sort of <laughs> rolling RBO, if I can call it that. The union um, arrived saying, we want co-determination. Management's useless. We need co-determination. Um, instantly, there was uh, the hackles rose on the part of management, the management team, and they resisted it. And um, the new CEO just took a line. He said, look, all business is an experiment, in fact. Why don't we get past the fears of the terms? And let's just talk about what everybody really wants and means here and try stuff. Um, and if you go to the next page, the next slide, yeah. Um, where we went was um, a revisit of the vision for the company and the mission statement. Um, 
based on what the union was putting forward, a restructuring of committees to enable people to listen better to one another and to feel more participative. Um, and this involved a company steering committee and plant working groups. The management wanted uh, basically a, a system of quality circles, teams, um, and got increasingly nervous as the plant working group and company steering committee structures were put in place, all except for the leaders who spent time with their people saying we need, we need to have forums at every level to enable us to deal with our common problem of survival, basically. And um, the, with the logic of, if these things don't work, we can try something else down the road, but let's give it at least a year and try out the use of these structures. And then the question of, and how will we treat each other in these structures? which we have put together to deal with the production problems in order to achieve our vision. And the evolution of that values, a uh, list of values there, which is show respect, honor commitments, be trustworthy, continuously look for ways to improve our relationship, use of non-adversarial approaches to resolving disputes. Um, and the, um, in, in many senses, this moved beyond the more common experience in my time of improving or redesigning communi simply communication channels, um, dealing with the issues of discrimination and training and opportunities, issues of mutual respect. But I hang on to this one because it suggests that um, you can redesign organizations quite quickly in a state of crisis. Um, if people commonly recognize that crisis and are willing to be flexible about how they do things. And this particular CEO sort of line was, look, uh, what I do is move across companies helping people save themselves, save their organizations for themselves. How you deal with it longer term, well, that will that will flow out. But my job here, and I will move on to other jobs within you know, a few years. My job here is to help you uh, find each other in order to make this company workable. Um, and this process flowed out from simply a presentation of the starting point of problems along a, a sort of valuating uh, production process. Um, so all these different leadership styles, um, willingness to listen, openness to experiment with, with new structures, and a union willing to engage with the issues um, rather than simply the battle of the day. Um, the issue of what are we going to do with the organization rather than just the battle of the day, where I think critical points, and I think I've said enough, but I supply those two little maps because um, they just, I think, open some doors to larger transformational process possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mark. And um, we will be sharing the slides so people will have that to look at. Um, Ace, what would you like to add, having heard your colleagues and um, thought about what they've said? I, th I think what, what, what cuts across the presentations is the one important issue is that this is not a, a simple, easy uh, process, but we have to manage it very carefully. Uh, there are nuances in every circumstances that you need to apply your mind very carefully to. This is why the pre-RBO is very, very critical. It's not a tick box exercise or an administrative tick box. You need to think carefully, as Mishak said, uh, into how you enter this process, how you plan for it, and understand what is the, at the root cause of uh, what the parties require. So it's important that uh, you do a thorough preparation 
before you, you enter the app. Perhaps where we're failing, uh, Felicity, is over the years we've been lamenting about the lack of workplace forums. Perhaps, perhaps we need to make a, a brave prognosis and say that when you talk about annual RBOs, we, we're perhaps also trying to answer the question, how do we spread the message to businesses to embrace the RBO and incorporate it as part of their people strategies? So that uh, in the final analysis, what we're trying to achieve is to create an enabling platform for us to realize the, the, the workplace forum. Mm. Because I think the RBO uh, is, is pivotal, is transformational and catalytic. And if really we embed the notion of the RBO as an important value add process, that would be able to perhaps create the foundation for creating work, workplace forum. Yeah, that's my point. Thanks. And for creating really avenues like Mark has uh, described for um, supporting much broader trans business transformation processes. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Meshek, um, what about you? Is there anything you can, you'd like to add having heard your colleagues? Um, no, Felicity, not much, but I just want to make one important um, observation that has always uh, excited me. You know, at the commencement of the process, you can actually feel the tension. You even observe it, say, during tea times and lunchtime on that first day, where people don't want to mix and um, they are in their own groups of employer unions and so on. But when it comes to a stage where you do solution finding and all that. I would mix the groups in order to find these solutions. Mm. And I, I move away from them. But when, when you see the group in action, um, I think they forget that I'm from the employer, I'm from the union. They work so well together. And you'll find that the many problems that may have taken them six months to resolve within an hour or two, they work together and are able to come up with, with solutions. For me, that's a very um, excellent demonstration that this is a very effective process and it's a process that uh, helps uh, companies and unions. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have the impression Mark is busily typing a, an answer to Clive. So let me put the question to you. Meshach, and then uh, Mark can follow up with his answer, which will be in the Q&A. And, and Clive's question is, um, at the commencement of the process, first day, do you not feel there's a need for a considered situational analysis by the parties? Um, and I must say, that's something I've always wondered about the RBO. Should we not be starting with, you know, sort of what's, what's going on for each of us and where are we at? But I, I, I religiously stick to the um, proposal-driven strategy that, that has been described. And it does magically um, move you on. You, you still have those cathartic conversations as you talk through the proposals, but it moves you on. But what is your experience of moving from that tension that you describe at the beginning where everyone's sitting on the opposite side of the rooms eyeing one another, and how do you move them beyond? Is it the proposal process or is there something else? Do you need a catharsis yeah. at the beginning? Yeah, there are, two, there are two things that I'll talk to that are linked to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first one, of course, would be the cost. Um, you don't want to uh, take a whole lot of time because they've given you only two days, so you don't have much luxury. But um, in terms of uh, the outline itself, you can customize it depending on your clients. I have had situations where it's important to start by what, what it comes out on the introductions. When people talk about their names and what do I want of the, out of this process and why is it good for me and all those things and so on. Then they start throwing things at one another and so on. Then one may ask the question, but out of all this, is there no positive things that you have? 
Then they'll spend another 10, 15 minutes to say, no, here are the positives and so on. So at the back of your mind, you've got a little bit of the negative, you've got a little bit of the positives, and then you can move on from there. But for me, if you have, say, a three-day process, um, I would go along with uh, what Clive was asking, just to start from there, just to identify those negatives from the onset. Right, right. So it depends on the circumstances, and you might just expand that bit up front. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Mark, you used the... Um, the term vomit on management or it was rather used to you and I suppose that's the that's a good illustration of <laughs> catharsis so so just take us through the response you put into the chat into the answer yeah um Clive of course has the the um skill always to ask the big question that um confounds one at the uh, at the end but um it's a good question because you know, what do you do with these um, unexpecteds if you haven't done prepared? Now, um, and, and what are the risks? And I th there is risk. And I think a relationship building process carries risk because you enter it blind anyway. It's not like a wage dispute where you know what the what the opening offers and demands are, and then what the sticking points are and the outstanding issues. You go into a relationship inevitably carries uh, the unexpected. And people are strategic in how they frame things. So um, uh, my answer to Clive suggests uh, a couple of things. First, are you the pre-sessions to me are in fact you know, probably a half day. So there's, when you're meeting with the parties to discuss the process and to lay out, to gather whether there's going to be a commitment to the ground rules and to the intention and to the boundaries of the process and so on, in a sense, you, you're doing, I think, a at least cursory situational analysis okay. um, in terms of parties' readiness to enter a process. I've, I have gone and, and talked to parties and jointly we've decided not to continue until certain things have been done. Um, the, the end of, of an inquiry, the end of, um, you know, something that's still live in another process that you think might um, be pulled back into the RBO. The other thing is that if unexpecteds arise, um, this is not intended to be a one-off process. Um, so new adversarial issues may indeed happen, but um, part of the job of an RBO is helping parties design systems to manage conflicts more effectively long-term. So to the creation of task groups, the creation of working groups to deal with certain issues um, means that you can you're not parking the issue, but you're creating systems and processes to manage those long-term, either with you or without you down the road. So um, the, look, I've done strat planning processes where I also hold to a fairly um, structured process of defining mission first, then vision, and then method and uh, then doing the analysis and quite a lot of managers say look you should be doing a situational analysis first and, and I have a little difference with that in that if you don't know where you're going you, you you're not terribly sure uh, what aspects of your context you should be addressing so to me mission is critical that's the pull factor for all the stakeholders, and, and then how are we going to deal with each other? Do we understand that going into the process? And then pretty much anything can come up. And um, the, the art is to help the parties design processes that will carry them into their own future. Just like the proposal development process is one of helping them develop their own agenda um, that you're going to work with over the next couple of days. So. Um, I don't know whether that addresses the 
Clive's problem fully, but um, hopefully parts of it anyway. And catharsis, sorry, there's research on catharsis, um, which suggests that venting actually can deepen hostility, entrench anger, um, raise blood pressure. Um, by constantly reiterating anger, you deepen it rather than lose it. Um, and I think there's a, there's a clear place for catharsis in certain environments, certainly more clinical or therapeutic environments. But in conditions like this, where you're trying to get people into a process of finding each other first at a level of trust in order to progressively build a relationship and design systems to build trust and so on and confidence. Um, I think the cathartic element, often people are experienced in catharsis without coming, without it coming to a, to a, a fruitful end. And, and here you're trying to say, channel that catharsis into something more productive. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Well, um, considering Mishak's uh, strong points about ground rules, um, I think we need to wrap up. Our time ground rule is uh, mm -hmm. to, to basically finish off now, and a couple of people have peeled away already. Um, so there's so much to talk about. We could continue, and perhaps we will continue in a, in a future webinar to talk about um, implementation and um, and, and how this can be helpful in promoting collaboration and cooperation in the, in the workplace. Um, but it really just leaves it to me uh, to thank our speakers for their, their time and insights and bringing their enormous experience to bear um, in this conversation. So thank you. And we will send out a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording so that uh, those who had to leave or might have missed the early part can catch up. Um, and if you do, um, if you would like to talk more about how an R RBI might benefit or RBO might benefit your organization, please contact us at, at Conflict Dynamics. Um, our email addresses are on the website. We have uh, experienced facilitators like those you have heard from to work with you. And uh, we are deeply committed to transformation of workplaces to make them happier and more productive places to work. So thank you, everybody.